don't know about you, but I'm just really depressed now <laughs> for watching that. Good morning, and thank you so much, uh, everyone at ITBS and the U.S. Institute for Peace. It is my pleasure and my absolute honor to be here with you this morning. Um, with this clip, we just saw how Ellsberg turned to one of a limited number of media outlets, the New York Times, to first release the Pentagon Papers. Likewise, trusting its reporting and analysis, the public relied on the Times and a handful of others for the rest of the story. How times have changed. Yet while the prof professional media is retrenching, new media has exploded. Um, under the technological and economic pressures generated by cable and the internet, the typical viewer now confronts hundreds, even thousands of potential sources for news and the stiff competition for audiences means the newspaper business is shrinking, foreign news bureaus are closing and reporting budgets are being cut. So how do we, how do we fix this? How can we seize this unusually dynamic, some say transformational moment in the media landscape to make the new global news business a potent force for conflict management in the world? And is this antithetical to the idea that journalism must be objective and neutral? We've got the perfect mix of panelists, so let's jump right in and meet them. Frank Sesner made his reputation as an Emmy Award-winning journalist, commentator, and documentary filmmaker during a 21-year career at CNN. Currently, he's the director of the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University, where he teaches documentary filmmaking and journalism ethics. After her time with CNN, Rebecca McKinnon founded Global Voices, a network now comprising 300 citizen journalists and bloggers stretching across over 100 nations. At present, she's on sabbatical from the University of Hong Kong, where she teaches online journalism and conducts research on the internet, China, and censorship. As a journalist, Dan Frumkin's career parallels the rise of new media. Beginning as a reporter for the Winston-Salem Journal, he shifted to online journalism in the late 1990s. Most recently, he was the editor of WashingtonPost.com before joining the Huffington Post as a senior Washington correspondent. Marvin Kalb is one of those people that need no introduction. A career spanning 30 years of award-winning reporting for CBS and NBC News, most prominently as the host of NBC's Meet the Press. In 2006, he received the National Press Club's Fourth State, Fourth Estate Award for his contributions to the news profession. Maurice Kahn is a recognized face worldwide following extensive careers with the BBC, CNN, and now Al Jazeera English. He hosts Riz Khan, a show broadcast live on Al Jazeera English in which viewers from around the world question world leaders, news newsmakers, and celebrities directly. Please join me in welcoming our panel. Okay, what we're, um, we're, we're basically going to have a conversation, so everyone feel free to interrupt if you feel compelled to speak. Uh, and we are also going to be relying on questions from our audience as well as our online audience, so we'll also be watching out for those. Um, I guess I want to start with, um, let's ask you, Frank. <laughs> um, listening to, to Sheldon's presentation and watching the Pentagon Papers, um, you know, I, I mean, from my own personal experience, I remember um, reporting the Iraq War at the height of the war, and I don't mean 2003, I mean 2006, when ethnic cleansing was taking its toll, and lots of media were pulling out because it was security costs, it was so dangerous to be there. 
And the question was, why are you still there? And for me, it was very simple. If we're not there, then people will rely on messages from the military, which had its own message to sell, or the insurgents, which also have their own way of putting out their messages. Um, is that is that still the job that we have to do today, or what do you what do you basically say to your students these days? <laughs> Good luck. Uh, no, I think that the, the, the your question, the clip, and Sheldon's comments uh, suggest the layers of engagement that we, as journalists, as communicators, as these practitioners of this these new technologies have. At the first level, we have to just convey information. We have to take people to see and learn with their own eyes and ears. There has to be that level of detachment which doesn't always exist. So at the, at the most basic level, they know. They know what's happening, the good, the bad, the ugly, and it will be the ugly that comes first in a situation like that. News is not, as we know, and we've said a thousand times about the planes that land, news is about the planes that crash. And that first bias, that bias, some see it as a bias toward negativity, but it's also a bias toward you know, what's unusual, um, is, is what will always come first. But the question then becomes, and this is where it gets exceptionally challenging in the middle of an example like yours, is can you step out of your own experience as a journalist, traditional or non-traditional, to take people in some unexpected place? We saw very little of that, for example, in this country as we marched up to the Iraq war where people reporters or others were prepared to challenge the government's version of events because it was then somehow deemed as inappropriate or unpatriotic. It would have been inconceivable, Riz, for, I think, an Al Jazeera journalist to stand up, and we've got any number of examples of this on in, in any media, to stand up and say, uh, you know, the Arab public or the, 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 the Iraqi street uh, has brought this on itself. <laughs> you know, I mean... So you go against the narrative, you go against the fundamental narrative, especially when you're marching up toward conflict and war, um, with great difficulty. And, what, and that's what, what Ellsberg's story, I think, illustrates so brilliantly, what it takes uh, uh, in the midst of a, of a war or in the midst of a conflict to stand up and say, hey, it's completely different than you see. And going against that, that, that national tide of, 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 of nationalism and, and conflict, where people may see it as existential, um, and will argue that compellingly. I think, Riz, I think one of the criticisms of particularly Al Jazeera Arabic is, um, and I know from watching it myself, it can be quite emotional and, uh, and, and not as sort of, um, I guess, objective and impartial as, as you would, as Al Jazeera English is, for example. Um, how do you balance that? And, 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 and what, I mean, what, what's your position on that? Well, first, I can't speak for uh, um, Al Jazeera Arabic. Um, I personally don't speak Arabic, so I can't even watch it with a, a true degree of judgment. <laughs> I'm just glad that people don't run for the doors when I say I'm from Al Jazeera, which is a, a changing uh, mood here nowadays. Um, it's interesting because there's, there's a tendency to judge um, channels, judge uh, programming, without really knowing much about it. One of the guys from the Arabic channel who's, uh, who helped set up the Washington Bureau um, said to the Western media one time, he said, look, the difference is you show the missiles being fired, we also show them landing. And I think that was a shock for a lot of people that there could be another, another point of view. Uh, I always ask, what's the media trying to achieve? And the thing is that I was trained at the BBC and it's sort of been beaten into me and I feel to some degree a dying breed now. We were taught as broadcast journalists, we weren't there to editorialize or even really to comment. We were there to just broadcast the facts and, and the information. And by doing it in a fair and balanced manner and making sure we checked our sources and uh, and, and validated the information that we were actually doing something that people could then use and make their judgments on. Um, the thing is that the media has changed very much now and it's become very much, even the broadcast media has become very much a commentating uh, vehicle. And that, that bothers me a lot. It sort of goes against the grain of my training. Um, but as I say, I'm a dying breed and the pressure is on, you know, when, when we have a guest on, if they're a high-powered guest, we're, we're, you know, we hear the words in the newsroom, but like, we need to hammer them. Well, what does that mean? You know, we need to hammer them. I'm not there to hammer anyone. I'm there to actually get some facts and figures out. So I feel it's a difficult position now for journalists if they want to stay very much middle of the road. It's interesting because when I arrived, I arrived late last night from a trip um, across the other side of the country, and I arrived and I had two books on my, on my desk, which I unpacked. Letters to my torturer and the, the most dangerous place, Pakistan's lawless frontier. Uh, Imtiaz, I know, is a good journalist. He's, you know, he's, he's very much a respected person who contributes to our channel, to CNN. 
the thing is, when I looked at these, I thought, well, what's the, you know, people walking past the bookshop, what are they seeing? <laughs> They're seeing brown men with beards, swarthy looking people waving guns and chanting. Here, uh, the dark face of, uh, again, a person looks like very much, you know, oppressed and so on. The thing about it is, is this sets a, a tone. I think, you know, the, the whole point of this uh, gathering this morning was to look at media as a way to try to promote a different point of view, to maybe look at something positively. And so I find myself wondering, you know, when we have things like this, uh, and, and I, I, the intention is probably very good, but what are we doing? What is the media trying to achieve? And from print to broadcast and so on. So I think people, going back to your question, I know I've gone on a bit here, but going back to your question, channels function differently uh, in terms of the way they deliver stuff. I mean, I, I, traveling around Europe, if I watch a, uh, an Austrian television channel, I remember, remember watching the downfall of the Ceausescu uh, regime uh, on, in Austria, and it was interesting watching how stoic and serious the, the presenters were. There was really nothing really like this. And I couldn't understand properly what was being said, but it was very flat. You go to Italy, and it's like it could be the smallest thing, but they're waving their arms and screaming and shouting. Mm -hmm. So the difference is, when you watch Al Jazeera Arabic, you're watching a culture yeah. as well as the content. So this idea of it being emotional, these guys are shouting and screaming at each other, abu hurling abuse, and then off camera it's Habibi, Habibi. <laughs> and they see each other the next day and they go back to <laughs> it again. <laughs> it becomes a show. So when you ask about balance, the emotion is different from the balance. Right. right. Well, uh, I guess a question I can ask Dan is, well, if there we're blurring the line between fact and commentary, how can people find the truth? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, that's a very small, light question. Yeah, really. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think that there's a... Uh, I'm a huge fan of traditional journalism, and I think that it's extraordinarily important for us to continue doing that sort of work. Um, I also think it's, it's potentially a mistake for us to get too misty-eyed about journalists' objectivity and, and you know, the great role that, that traditional media has played in the past. Uh, I mean, nobody has done a better job of propagandizing and, and, and uh, rallying countries for war than the, than the so-called traditional media. Um, you know, the... Uh, uh, in the... Uh, I think I think Riven's point about th you know that, that traditional media tends to cover the missiles you know launching and not the missiles landing I think is a very very good one. Um, I think uh, you know so although I, I'm I'm very concerned about the the, the, the decline of, of traditional journalism uh, and you know you know whenever a foreign bureau closes I think it's a total tragedy. Uh, on the other hand, I'm a, I'm a tremendous internet optimist. I I really believe that. Uh, when it comes to either the media or conflict resolution, and certainly the media and conflict resolution, more voices is better. Um, there will be dislocation, there will be extremism, but more voices is better. Uh, and right now, for instance, when it comes to international uh, news, I mean, there are more, there's more information out there available to more people in more different ways and in places ways where they can contribute and they can, they can participate than, than ever before. So, uh, you know, and, and, and I just can't help but think that uh, in some places we, we, we don't have enough, uh, if not opinion, at least an analysis, uh, honest analysis of what's going on. I mean, I, I firmly believe, for instance, that if uh, the, the blogosphere and the Twitter sphere and, and what have you had been around just a few years earlier, I think we might not have gone to war in Iraq. I think during the run-up to war in Iraq, uh, you know, the MSM coverage was, 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 was terrible. and. If uh, if there had been a blogosphere, we would have been able to uh, serve as a megaphone for the what little excellent journalism there was. I mean, there were there were some tremendous stories written by uh, Knight Ritter, now McClatchy, and and a few other journalists. And and I think the, the blogosphere could have really given them attention. The blogosphere could have given attention to uh, to to the voices of of, of protest that, uh, from the streets and from the Senate floor that that weren't heard. Uh, so I think we need just I, I'm just feeling like the more voices the better. <laughs> Just a brief interjection, by the way. Traditional media, in, in Britain, there's a separation between the broadcast and the print media. Mm -hmm. The print media can editorialize, can comment, and people know when they pick up the paper where it's coming from. But the, the broadcast media is different. So in traditional media, when, Dan, when you say traditional media, in Britain there was distinct roles. Um, I wanted to ask a question of Marvin Kalb about the traditional media and um, given, given everything that Dan has just said about um, if we had the blogosphere to pr help us prevent the war compared to what we just saw in that clip. And also, um, is it really, I keep coming back to this, is it really our job to promote anything, whether it's peace or war? That's a marvelous question. Thank you very much. Is it our job to promote peace or war? My answer to that is no. Uh, I have a great problem with definitions 
It is the easiest thing. It is my heart that speaks when I say I wish that the media writ large could do big things to produce more peaceful solutions to problems all over the world. I wish as a result of the work of the media, more kids were not hungry and more kids could read. I wish that were the case. I wish that in a world of the blogosphere, there would be more knowledge, right? More knowledge than there is today in the blogosphere. My problem has to do with definition. I am not sure as a product of the past. I am not sure what media is. I haven't been sure since the first time it was used to describe me, which was in October of 1969 by the Vice President of the United States, Spiro Agnew, who said that these people from the northeast part of the United States, <laughs> part of the media, they're this strange foreign group, and what were they doing here? He was the first one to suggest that journalism was part of this broader world of the media. Today, truthfully, I don't know what the media is. The media could be what it is that a private organization puts out and says is information. I also would like to believe that there is a distinct value and understanding of what journalism is and that journalism may be a part of the media, but it is not a substitute for the media. It's not the same thing. So my plea at this point is that as we rush forward and believe that the new world of new technology is going to bring us peace and freedom and prosperity, that we understand what it is that we're talking about and that we do not dismiss too casually the value of a reporter knowing a language, going to a country, covering a war, understanding what it's all about, rather than just picking stuff up from the AP wire, from Reuters, and just giving their opinion. That, to me, is a greater danger than anything we face today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Rebecca, um, how do you manage all of your citizen journalists and what do you tell them, especially the ones who are in conflict zones? Uh, we don't manage them. Okay. Um, it, Global Voices Online um, started really as just a platform to aggregate and curate voices from around the world. That in, in 2004, my, my co-founder Ethan Zuckerman and I were seeing that there, that there was this proliferation of people blogging around the world, and that people in the English-speaking world weren't really noticing a lot of these people. Um, and people had all kinds of different motivations. One example is a, a, a guy in Bahrain named Mahmoud who started blogging in English because he was sick and tired of the mainstream media portraying all the Muslims as crazy people. And, and his point was, you know, there's this kind of more silent majority of people who want to just go about their lives as, as everyone else, and he felt that that was not the image uh, you know, the Muslim society that he lived day by day was not the Muslim so society he felt the international media was portraying. So he started speaking. And, and there, there were people writing online for, you know, any number of reasons. And we just started curating this and, and inviting people from various regions to curate the conversation coming from, from their regions. And really, the, the project, that is, as it has evolved, we've now we've now got an advocacy arm that we, we we've got bloggers who are translating content back and forth between over a dozen different languages and that everything that our project does was initiated by the people involved now there there are a set of common values we, we sort of have a global voices manifesto which is that everybody has the right to speak and be heard we we have a moderation system that doesn't allow hate speech uh, but, you know, what is hate speech and what is not, often that gets worked out in our it's internal discussion lists. But it's not a central editorial team who says you will do this and you will not do that. It's the community that really debates uh, what the boundaries should be. Um, but I, I'd, I'd like to make a, a number of points just in, in response to some of the things that have been said. Um, one has to do with the purpose of media, and, and I would really like to echo... Uh, Marvin's point uh, uh, about, uh, you know, is the purpose of media or journalism or whatever you want to call it uh, anything in particular. 
Uh, and, you know, Global Voices, we actually are not registered in the United States. We're registered in the Netherlands as, as a nonprofit. And one of the reasons is that our community, we're very concerned that, our, that we would be perceived as being used by the U.S. government, even if we weren't. Uh, and and so that there there's there's a tremendous um, a tremendously strong feeling amongst our community that we we need to to have uh, an independent voice uh, and also a, a very strong feeling that voices that advocate violence even though you might they might make you un, uh, uncomfortable sometimes they need to be translated and explained. And, and, and that there needs to be, that you need to have a discussion around them rather than say, we're only going to link, for instance, to uh, Iranian bloggers that, that promote a certain point of view and not Iranian bloggers that promote another point of view. Uh, because th there are times when you just need to have that information out there and, and discussed. Um, and so that if we had a very specific agenda, um, there's concern that that could lead uh, in, in directions that might actually stifle discussion. Um, I guess the, the other issue, too, is uh, relates to, you know, how do you even define peace and how do you define hate? And, and the whole problem with setting standards for media globally is very difficult. And, and sometimes, I mean, I, I worked in China for a long time, and the Chinese government actually uses... Um, this, this line that it's the role of journalists to promote stability and peace as an excuse to censor voices that might express sympathy with Tibetan independence or autonomy, for instance, and, and surrounding the, 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 the riots in Tibet and, and the riots in Xinjiang, which is in China's far northwest, actually suppression of independent opinions that might, uh, you know, be... Um, advocating solutions that are different than what the Chinese government advocated was justified in the name of peace. So we have to be very, very careful uh, uh, about where we take this and that, that different kind of authorities define this very differently. And um, I, I guess one other point is as well, um, despite having created or helped to foster um, and now no longer being able to control or trying to control uh, <laughs> an international bloggers community. Um, I'm actually not a cyber utopian. I don't think that just because we have the internet that there's going to be more world peace, uh, that, that people are going to be more enlightened, or that there's necessarily going to be more democracy. Um, but we've seen a shift that we need to deal with. We're not going to be going back to the pre-internet age. Uh, and as actually one of our board members, Rosenthal Alves, who's at the Knight Center for the Americas in Texas, likes to put it, you know, the media environment today, so in the past, it was, it was a desert. And so we built institutions and, and ways of managing scarcity uh, and a whole economy uh, around information, a whole sort of set of politics, political discourse that was all around information scarcity. Then came the rain. We're now in a rainforest. There's a whole new set of complex organisms, all kinds of uh, things that we've never seen, never heard of. Some are poisonous, some are predatory, some, some are medic medicinal, some are just silly. You know, th there's all these, uh, it's, it's a completely new environment. And so, you know, figuring out how to build a civilization within this environment of, of excess <laughs> Um, and overabundance and, and just organic growth exponentially uh, is, is a completely different thing. And it, it requires thinking about institutions differently, thinking about political discourse differently, perhaps even thinking about sovereignty and legitimacy differently. I mean, it really, the, the, the equation has changed tremendously. But just, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, you know, there, there are all the slides, and I'll stop in a moment, there are all the slides of, of the hate speech that the Internet enables. Certainly that's the case. And, uh, you know, in this new environment, if we don't build a civilization and if citizens don't take it upon themselves, and in Global Voices it's kind of one community of people who, who are just taking the initiative to engage because they're concerned about where different things are headed, 
um, if we if we don't encourage to take matters into their own hands uh, and and to speak out and to try and form new kinds of communities of discourse, find ways to 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 speak whether it's popular or unpopular. Uh, we will have a Hobbesian state of nature in which life is nasty, brutish, and short. I mean, that's a, that's a possible outcome. And and so, yeah, it's it's we're only at the very beginning of figuring out where to go. Right. Yeah, j just jump in on a few things. First of all, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank the Chinese for at least being explicit about what they do. <laughs> I recall, I recall a, a, a trip that I was on not long ago. Uh, and I went into Shanghai Media Group, which is a large media group in Shanghai, and they were showing us their incredible new facilities. Amazing studio, amazing technology, amazing new staff, and then we went down the amazing hallway where they had amazing brass plaques on each door, each door, both in Chinese characters and in English, um, which was a really arresting moment when we got to censorship room number one <laughs> and censorship room number two. So at least we knew what we were dealing with. But, <laughs> but Knowing what we're dealing with, I think, is part of the challenge now, just as everybody has said, because the world has changed so much. So while we are sitting here and Newsweek is looking for its new owners because its readership has plummeted and its advertising, and I just flipped through the other day, and it, if you look at the advertising in the latest issue of Newsweek, unless you're you know, of a certain age and like what the pharmaceuticals are offering, <laughs> <laughs> or of a certain age and have anything left to invest, or like cigars, there are no ads in that magazine that apply to you. And that's what one of the reasons it's on the block. As we sit here and CNN is dealing with numbers that have gone down 40% and rebounded a little bit, I use my media to, with my smartphone, to send a text to Steve Grove, who is the head of news and politics for YouTube, to ask him how many page, how many views there are a day on YouTube. Over a billion video views a day, he messages back in real time. A billion a day. The problem is what they're looking at on YouTube <laughs> is Charlie bit my finger. For those of you who've seen, Charlie bit my finger has been viewed by more than 170 million times. What is it? Oh, it's a real, it's a wonderful video. It's <laughs> <laughs> you haven't seen, how many of you have seen Charlie bit my finger? Look at that. Now, now, if we can have you all watching Peace, we can get someplace. Wow. So Charlie bit my finger is this little kid with his little brother on his lap. He's about four years old or so. His brother puts his finger in his mouth. <laughs> He bites down. The little kid's face is, Charlie bit my finger. And 170 million people <laughs> watch it or views. I don't know. So what are we dealing with here? We're dealing with a fundamentally different world. It's not gathering to see Walter Cronkite anymore at 630. And your Global Voices, or the project I'm working on called Planet Forward, which is done out of the, out of the university where we are also working with user-generated content, is this richly uneven, unpredictable place where there the rules are entirely different, not recognized, not followed, and the things that draw the eyeballs tend to be the sensational, the weird, the funny, the outrageous, and they will tend to be, just as you tend to have people who show up at a town hall meeting in New England or at a city council meeting someplace, the people who are the angriest and the loudest who get the most attention. That's human nature. So when Sheldon and Richard and everybody else say, how do we encourage peace through media, let us recognize first that we're up against both human nature <laughs> and up against the, the, the media, plural, that we're talking about here as these rules are changing fundamentally. Start with that, define the challenge, and then maybe we can fill in the blank. Actually, one of the, the prime uh, issues we have is that the Internet is still primarily an English language medium. And that means that the information that's on the internet is primarily from an English language perspective, which means, say, Western dominated. And that makes a big difference. I think once uh, countries like China, India, Pakistan, uh, the Middle East start to get their sort of grips on it, things might change. Because right now, the, the biggest problem, and I think the first step in the media changing things, is to try to st stop and think twice about the stereotyping that occurs. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I have a British passport. I was born in Yemen. I have a Pakistani last name. And, uh, and I travel to some interesting far-flung places, so you can imagine the latex gloves come out every time I arrive at the airport. Um, <laughs> you really, actually, you really <laughs> like the TSA, don't you? No, actually, I don't have that much of a problem, except that my four-year-old daughter was put on a watch list, uh, and she terrorizes my home, but she hasn't done anything <laughs> <laughs> to affect national security yet. Um, so, you know, the stereotyping, that, you know, they see the name Khan, first thing is, you know, okay, 
one side. I get, you know, like, n- not just four S's. I get so many S's, I say I must be ugly, too, because, you know, you're pulling me aside so many times. But um, actually, one of the key things is the media tends to stereotype. And like I pointed out with these books, I mean, the book covers, there is a tendency to go down this easy path, especially in the day of talking heads TV and radio and, um, you know, analysis and commentating and so on. There's a tendency, you know, a guy gets on a plane, attempts something like, you know, explosives, and suddenly you're analyzing it from every single perspective, and it's everyone's opinion. It's not really necessarily that factual. It's just purely opinion, and it's become a, a media circus. You know, they say an expert is someone who has made all the mistakes possible in a very narrow field. We have a lot of those. Uh, they say a consultant is someone you give your watch to so they can tell you the time. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it, this is what we've gone down, that path. And on that note, we're going to take some questions from the audience. I ask that when you do, um, uh, please stand up, identify yourself, and, uh, and, and where you're from. We've got one at the back there. Hi, my, na- my name is Andy Grable. I'm from Decatur, Georgia. And my question um, is in reference to what I think was a watershed moment in the history of media last year during the Iranian elections where on Huffington Post and to a lesser degree some other media outlets were seeing what appears to be really up to the minute postings and things that are coming through as they are taking place there. And this is coming from a society that does not have freedom of the press. And I'm wondering if you believe that this is something that we may see occurring more in uh, societies where there is not this freedom and also um, how media can present this and also provide some thoughtful analysis for people um, that don't have a context or a frame of reference for these events as they're unfolding. Yeah, that's a good question. I I would like to take a crack at that. I think it's an excellent question, a very important one. And I think you're absolutely right that the next time we see last June in Iran again somewhere, it's going to be covered in roughly the same way. There are a couple of reasons for that. There were not in Iran... Um, journalists who were based there in order to cover that particular kind of an event, in order to cover anything. There were one or two mainstream journalists from the U.S. there. There were not many. And so what we saw were the people holding up this kind of a device, the iPhone or iPad, taking a picture and then presenting it to the world. The tendency was to believe that that picture conveyed total reality. It sure conveyed part of the reality. But because we didn't have the other part, we didn't have the eyes to watch what was going on, the ears to hear what was going on, it was very difficult to put the picture into some kind of proper context. So it was exciting, but it might have been misleading in terms of creating an image larger, an image of of rebellion larger than, in fact, was the case. So my sense is that a camera can create the environment or the reality of what it's pointed at, but somebody has to point the camera in the right direction. The camera itself is just an instrument. There has to be a brain behind it saying, what I'm pointing at is the story. It's really important. We don't know that. The camera, this, the iPad, iPhone, whatever these things are called, <laughs> they, were, they were conveying what that person felt was centrally important to the story. But that person was not a journalist. And forgive me for going back to this central point. Under the banner of media, everyone has a voice. That voice may know what he or she is talking about and may not. And we get an awful lot of opinion. I think you're absolutely right on that point. So we have to be careful about what we hear, what we see, and always, always, for our common benefit, ask the question, who's directing the lens? Where where is it all emerging? There has to be a head behind it. Without a brain, it's nothing. It's what Morrow in 1957 or 8 called only wires and lights in a box. There's information in this perspective. That's really what it is. Um, so let, me, let, me, let me jump in uh, as, as the HuffPost guy. Um, uh, yes, I agree. It was a very exciting moment. And actually, I arrived at HuffPost shortly after it happened, so I can take no credit whatsoever. Um, but 
uh, I think it was an extraordinary moment, and I think the uh, information that was ab we were able to gather through, you know, people media uh, turned out to be of great value. And um, if I had to choose between what was created there and, you know, one mainstream journalist whose movements were limited, whose access was controlled by the government, whose perspectives were very old school, I would probably pick uh, the Twitter version. Thank you. What do you mean by um, old but, school? But I, don't have to ch <laughs> but I don't have to make that choice. No, okay? but what do you I don't mean have by to, old I can get school? Both. What I mean is, is looking at it from a perspective of, you know, of say, of the U.S. Oh, I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. <laughs> what is old school? I mean, what are you trying to say? That Cronkite didn't know what he was doing? That represented no. old school. What I'm saying is that, that what, what, the, what the HuffPost uh, aggregation of these voices did was capture the real drama and the real tragedy of what was going on in the streets. But I think the question lives. is how do you present context with that? You can, I mean, how do you present uh, uh, an explanation or a perspective or, uh, you know, even just um, – just, just some context of a spotlight. Okay, this is what's happening here alongside an unfolding, you know, 24-7 yeah. internet. With curation, I bet Rebecca can talk about Well, uh, I mean, I'd, I'd actually, the other qu part of the, the gentleman's question, as I understood it, will just, you know, will this continue to be replicated, um, you know, to, to a larger and larger extent? And I, I think, obviously, the, the most ideal situation is you have the professional journalists and you have the citizen media, and, and, and you've got people who happen to be in places where the journalists aren't, and then, you know, it, you, you can get this, this synergy going. And I think okay. that the, the best journalism these days happens when that synergy uh, is, is at its fullest. But I, I, I want to respond to something else uh, about this Iran point, which is that there have been efforts actually to replicate what happened last year in Iran in more recent months, and they have failed. And why is that? Because these regimes learn quickly. Right. And the Iranian regime has figured out how to prevent that kind of, you know, quote-unquote Twitter revolution, uh, which wasn't a revolution, from, from happening again. They've made it very clear that people who appeared online with their faces recognizable, the, the, the Iranian government used crowdsourcing techniques to get other Iranian citizens to identify these people so that they could be arrested. And it's become very clear that the cell phone system is monitored uh, and so on. And, and so <coughs> it, it, it looks like we're, we're not going to have round two of, of the same kind of, of citizen media flowering that we had last year. And, and so, uh, I mean, this is, this is one of the concerns, is that we cannot assume that just because we have the Internet, authoritarian media controls or authoritarian regimes are going to crumble. Uh, and, you know, I've, I'm writing a whole book that, that kind of deals with the fact that China is really Exhibit A, uh, and many other regimes are learning how, how you actually survive as an authoritarian regime in the Internet age. And so we need to be careful about being too triumphal uh, about this situation. I remember um, during the Iran election, social media fallout. I don't know if anyone was on Facebook at the time. I'm guessing there were you know, 350 million people, but there was a request that people put on their status, uh, uh, up, um, status update to update your information to put your location down as Tehran to completely confuse mm. the Iranian government. And everyone was doing it and passing it along as well. And I remember, I remember that was a big part of it. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking for ways to uh, encourage uh, conflict resolution and so on on the Internet, and you're trying to, uh, to regulate things, I think regulating is the wrong way. I think, however, working to try to make sure that the Internet is as free and accessible as possible uh, is, is essential because I, I'm – uh, less concerned about extremism than I am about, about tyranny and about totalitarian regimes uh, clamping down on this. And especially, you know, it's ironic, but, uh, you know, we here in the States are getting a little bit concerned about uh, the fact that we don't have Internet privacy because all these marketing groups are able to, to, to you know, to harvest uh, information about us. It's not threatening to us, but in the hands of the totalitarian regime, it's, it's terrifying. Just a quick thought, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really one for, for free information. I think it's really important that there is – the internet unregulated, that there are people have a chance to post what they want. I think it comes down to education. I think people have to know from the start and, and be brought up with the uh, understanding that what's out there isn't filtered, that it's something that they have to learn to, to access uh, judiciously because the tendency is to 
to look at something and assume it's real just because it's out there. Something that's printed is real. Something that's broadcast or something that's uh, posted is, is, you know, is fact. And there's a tendency, especially with the younger generation, to just quickly uh, look for things and, and assume that everything they find. I went to an interesting lecture um, by a fellow called Julian Sher, who, who sort of teaches how to use the internet. And he took us to a site. He said, okay, what do you make of this site? And it was uh, a site about Dr. Martin Luther King. And he said, now read through this. And it starts off looking very, very much like it's uh, a tribute to Dr. Martin Luther King. But as you start to go through, it starts to question a few things and very cleverly weaves its way to a, to a point where, where it, you know, it makes questioning his values, questioning and so on. It was actually set up by a, a neo-Nazi, you know, um, uh, fascist group, you know, and, and it's very easy for someone to be roped into that and then think, oh, well, wait a minute, you know, it's, it's out there, it's real. It's very easy to, uh, to, to be misled without education. So I think education is the key. I, I, I want to come back to something that, that Marvin said because I think this is really the key, and, and when we think about the role that media play uh, in, in, in peace or in hate or in anything else, and, and I, I agree, this term media is now so big, so broad, right. That you know, we're talking about everything from, from from YouTube to the Wall Street Journal, and I uh, last time I checked, they were not owned by the same organization. <laughs> <laughs> Although, give it a, a week or two, <laughs> and they will be. Um, Third out will work out. But but <laughs> the first thing I think we need, and 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 this is an endangered species, is information. I mean, just straight information. When when I first joined CNN, and I don't know if this is still in place, we were literally told, and we told our reporters, do not start your live shot with the words I think. <laughs> Not because we don't think you think, although that was assumed sometimes, perhaps, but, <laughs> but because your opinion, th this is not about your opinion or your observation. You're welcome to that, and you certainly can say what is striking about it, but put it in an analytical, not an opinionated perspective. Watch how far you go with the interpretive nature, because the first thing we need to provide people with is a fact base, an information base. The old Nightline, when Ted Koppel was on there, started with a setup piece to provide the audience with the contextual information, that word again, so they could then assess the debate. One of the reasons I think CNN's crossfire evolved and was, was killed, right. and it I think should be brought back under the right circumstances, was because there was no context to start. It was just, it became just a shout fest between two people who, you know, were screaming their opinion in, in quick little sound bites. If that's what, excuse me, Al Jazeera, Global Voices, uh, OpposingViews.com, if that's mm -hmm. all we Ooh. can generate, people will be confused. They will have, they will not have that place to go and share the sense of, ah, this is legitimate. This is, it's not going to be the science, but something so, that we so can So how, how do we do that? How do we make a distinction for people to understand this is journalism and this is media? Trans first thing is transparency. I mean, you literally, you, this is, at, at Planet Forward, what are we doing? We have students, we have scientists, we have others who upload their videos and their thoughts and their blogs. We have people who are on staff. It's a tiny little operation, but one of the rules we've had is this is from our team. These are the rules that we follow when we, when we gather our information. This is a more traditional approach. This is the blogosphere. This is, here's what, here's the, the running room people have here. You at least convey absolutely clearly the rules by which each of these constituents play mm -hmm. so people at least know you know, what the, what the framework, what the context is. The giveaway is adjectives. Uh, the BBC, we weren't even allowed to use adjectives. I, mean, <laughs> um, I remember being in the uh, training at the BBC Radio Newsroom and uh, saw one of the, the writers take a script up to an editor and it said, and he read it out, he said, the long-running bloody civ uh, civil <laughs> war in Sri Lanka. He said, how many wars do you know that are not bloody? <laughs> they took it out? They <laughs> took out the word bloody. And that's the thing, adjectives are often a giveaway. Um, I've got a question here from Egypt and perhaps Marvin can tackle it first. Why didn't more journalists challenge the U.S. government in the lead-up to the Iraq war? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> well, very quickly, um, the United States after 9-11 was caught up in an avalanche of patriotism. The United States had been attacked, first time since Pearl Harbor, and we simply had to do something. And um, journalism journalists are also patriotic. And so there was no great uh, desire, strong urge to confront your government with what it is that you thought was a different line. And people pull back, and there was no question about that. Dan Rather spoke about fear. Yep. He used that word in the newsrooms of many, many organizations in the U.S. But we have to point out that there were people like Pincus at the, at the Washington Post 
who were doing very important stories that ended up on page 17, mm -hmm. not on page one. I think the person who asked the question is right. It was not the greatest day of American journalism, but that turned around very quickly when the reality began to turn. I don't think that journalists are great adventurers, but they do go along with reality. And when reality shifts, they will shift. There is no silver lining in this story, Marvin. I'm sorry. I actually, in this very room uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the Neiman Foundation for Journalism award, awarded its first I.F. Stone Award to John Walcott, who was the Washington bureau chief right. for McClatchy Newspapers. And uh, we had a very exciting uh, discussion here about what happened. And fear, fear was absolutely the issue. Journalists were afraid to call it like they saw it. And that's part of because of the corporate the structures in which they worked. It's because of the, the political pressures under which they operate. It's because of the fear of losing access with which they had. It's because of the entire uh, access journalism uh, uh, equation that, that cripples so many of our finest, smartest, most curious, and wonderful journalists. It was an absolute and complete failure. And that's why Al Jazeera got a bad name, by the way. Can yeah. That's why, because it, it, was, it was the darling of the US. I, 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 we, we need to do a yes but here, however. Mm -hmm. uh, the yes but is, Journalists may have done that, but they were not alone. And the voices that, though there, though there were some, but the voices that they would typically convey were largely silent. I recall uh, at, the, at, the, at the Washington Bureau here having a very partisan, very outspoken Democrat in for a background briefing who just flat out told us as we approached the 2002 election, we are, we are telling our, our, our members not to go after the president. This is not the time to raise, raise these questions. So while there were voices of, of, of doubt, and while this was by no means journalism's finest hour, I think it's very important to keep in mind that part of our job, a big part of our job, is to reflect the, the larger debate and the other voices out there. And they were many of them. We, we knew better. We knew better. And, and uh, yes, the, the, the political institutions failed us. But uh, there were voices. There were senators who got on the floor and made very uh, moving speeches that were not covered at all. It was an absolute intellectual decision that's on the part of the, right. of, of the journalists. And there, there were also voices from outside the United States of America who were raising serious questions, and they were not reflected yep. either. Um, we have a question from Colin in Illinois. Can we begin to speak of objectivity in a conflict-ridden world? And oh. Rebecca, perhaps you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, it, it's I'm sorry. Please. Okay. No, no, please. Okay. Um, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and I, I think really in this new environment, I, I agree with Frank that transparency is of absolute paramount. Um, who, who is this person who's speaking? Uh, and, and it is very difficult, you know, particularly in conflicts <laughs> where sort of everybody uh, has a camera phone, everybody is, is sharing information around. Uh, to, to work out what are the agendas and, and also to have people who are trying to sort out fact from fiction. But sometimes it's very difficult to define a fact. <laughs> it's very, very, very difficult. Um, so, again, yeah, it, it may be impossible to have total objectivity that satisfies everyone. May I just add to that? The, I go back to an earlier point. I appeal to as many people as choose to listen that we have to go back to defining what it is that we mean. We use words too lazily, too sloppily, and there are large pronouncements being made by people with very little knowledge, and they are accepted as if truth were just being uttered, and it wasn't. It may be that there are people around who still remember old-fashioned ideas and ideals about American journalism. It has to do with trying to find out, <clears throat> trying to get as close to the truth of a story as you can, in full recognition that you may fail, but at least make the effort in a fair way. And I think right now we get lost um, in the magic of the new technology into losing the very heartbeat of what it's all about, which is to provide information that is truthful and reliable to as many people as possible, and not to simply go with the raised voice, the coiffed head, or the deep voice. I mean, think about what is being said and raise questions. Be skeptical. Understand these things in a broader context. Sheldon was asking earlier on, is it possible to take the media today 
and use it as a force to go from hate to peace. And he suggested there might be the establishment of an international journalist council. Think about that. On the surface, excellent idea. How do you even establish the council? Who is going to be on it? Will, quote, the Middle East demand its representative? And who will that be? From what part of the Middle East? Will it be Western Europe? Is it the Frenchman or the Brit or the German? America? Well, of course, we're perfect. We can produce any number of people. <laughs> the Japanese, Asia, think about these issues. The complexity of taking the idea of using the media for peace building is a wonderful thought. It is an enriching thought. It's something that we ought to try to do, but with an understanding that we may not succeed because of the inherent difficulty of just defining issues and personalities. I want to jump in just uh, for a moment to, to see if I can find common ground with uh, Marvin Kalb, the gentleman on my left who I have admired uh, all my life and who uh, and whose uh, the journalistic values you have described are, are, are essential and I admire. Um, you know, journalists uh, were put on this earth to do a few things. Uh, one is to hold the powerful accountable. Uh, one is to tell stories. And another is to connect people to each other, to, to, to tell people about each other. <coughs> um, and it's on that last count in particular, I think, uh, that, that uh, there is some cause for optimism, especially when you look at the, inter when you look at the Internet, um, and also when you look at conflict resolution, because you know, it's no coincidence that most wars have started after a, a campaign of demonizing uh, our opponents. So if you can put a, a human face on people, uh, that advances peace. And I think that good journalism and, uh, and certain aspects of the Internet, including social networking, really do a great job of that. I think that if, um, you know, if you are uh, – if you, if you see that, that you know, the, our bombs are blowing up a house next door to uh, somebody who you thought – you know, a Facebook friend who likes the same YouTube videos that you like, I think it makes it a lot harder to be pumped about, uh, you know, about violence and destruction. So, so I do think that there are some areas that are exciting and positive. The comment is about Iran. We were talking about the images coming from Iran. Marvin was right if there was one image like that. But if you have 100 images coming, you can always make a story out of it yeah. by seeing repetition of the same thing or different things. Yes. And my question is, being a journalist, how can I be impartial and also promote peace? I think Marvin can take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the issue of the morning. It's what we're trying to talk about. We're trying to find some way of coming up with a formula that will allow the crazy world of modern day media to actually be moved in the direction of a peacemaking organ. I myself think it's going to be exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, because I'm not sure that that's what journalism does for a living. However, it's a wonderful thought, and to the degree that an editor back at home or the boss of a network can say to the people down below, hey, don't you think we ought to do a documentary on so-and-so. When Peter Jennings was around, he per because of his position and power, he was able to persuade the people at ABC to spend six hours in a year dealing with the environment. We all feel and know that's important, but it's very rarely, it's very rare that that much time is devoted to the subject. Peter was able to do it. So it can be done, and it has to do with a broad environment in the media at the very top that might somehow filter down to the editors and the producers who decide what goes on the air. Other than that, I'm not sure how it could happen. Can I, can I chip in a little bit here? What's happened, it's, it's like a pendulum um, in the idea of using media to build peace. I agree with what you said at the beginning, Marvin. It's not our job to build peace or to, um, you know, to, to be right. uh, the other end of the pendulum in, in terms of promoting war, condoning war. Um, I understand the concept of using media for peace, and I think that comes from putting the pendulum back into the middle. 
I mean, to use the controversial phrase, I'm, I'm sort of old school in that respect too. I think my job is there to inform and allow people to have a voice um, so that the general public can make a decision based on a good range of... Uh, a broad range of, of information that covers everything. When you said about the cameras, if they all came from the same side of the crowd, say two, two opposing groups are, uh, are clashing in the streets, if all those pictures came from one side, uh, then you're only going to see you're going to see all those pictures. It'll look like fact, but you haven't seen the pictures from the other side. Um, and and it, it's always an, it's a matter of perspective. I always tell the story of um, uh, an elderly lady who was uh, attacked in, um, in Central Park by a dog, and a young man helped sort of fight off the dog, fend off the dog. And a newspaper reporter from one of the local papers came and he, he found this, this fellow. He said, listen, it make a great headline. I can see it now. Local boy saves senior citizen from dog attack in Central Park. He says, well, I, I actually, I'm not local. He says, don't worry, I see it now. American hero saves pensioner from dog attack. He says, well, actually, I'm not American. I'm, I'm actually from the Middle East. I'm just studying here. And the next day, the headline said, local dog atta attacked by Arab terrorist. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's very easy to put a spin, the perspective. Um, Sheldon, you're going to have to forgive me because I have a live show coming up in a few minutes, so I'm going to have to skip. But I have to say, you know, the standard of journalism sometimes is, is questionable. Uh, I joke about a friend of mine who got so fed up with the way the industry was going that he decided that he was going to quit and, and get another job. And he, he got it into his head to join the FBI. And so he went for an interview at the FBI, and the guy said, well, he's a journalist. I better ask him a few questions. He liked the guy, but he said, I, I, I've got to ask him a few questions. So he said, what's two plus two? And the journalist said, four. He said, what's the square root of 100? And the guy thought about it for a minute and said, Ten. He said, good. Who shot JFK? And the journalist was like, I don't know. He said, oh, I'll tell you what. Why don't you think about it tonight and we'll, uh, we'll talk tomorrow. So I called him that night and I said, uh, how did your interview at the FBI go? Did you get the job? He said, not only did I get the job, I'm already on a murder case. So <laughs> I think we need a little more training in the industry. Would you, would you please forgive me? I have to run because I have a live show. Um, no arm waving or screaming or shouting. But uh, thank you very much as thank well for having me on the panel. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Rebecca, you wanted to say oh, something? Just, a, just a, this whole issue about what can we as journalists do to, to kind of perhaps maybe uh, promote uh, more fact-based discourse perhaps might be the best way to, as journalists, um, promote solutions of some kind. Um, and it's very difficult, and sometimes you're actually fighting your own bosses as a journalist, to, to, to be perfectly honest. I mean, yeah, imagine that. I mean, you know, I hate to say, I, a month before I left CNN, I was being told by my bosses, could you, you know, I, your, your expertise is getting in the way, and could you please cover your stories more like a tourist, because that's, that's what our audience relates to. And, and so, you know, and I'm not the only person in the industry who's had this kind of experience. And, you know, there, there was a, a, a point when I was in Northwest Frontier, uh, province, Pakistan, a, a month after 9-11, and, and being told not to cover so many stories about Afghan casualties of American bombings coming over who were, you know, you know, then inflaming local sentiment because this was too upsetting to American viewers and we should do less of this. Um, and, and, and so there are times when you do find that in order to get facts across that you feel the public needs to know, you're, you're fighting your bosses. I want to answer your question directly, and maybe it's a, I, I don't think it is your job to promote peace. <laughs> as a, as a, it's, it's your editor's job, and it's your job as a journalist to promote all the ideas, comfortable and otherwise, that constitute the story. That will promote peace, all right? I mean, you, you, it, the UN diplomat or Dick Solomon promote peace. You may decide to do a documentary on the peacemakers, and then you reveal their lives. I think what we need to do is we need to think much more deeply and thoughtfully, which is going against, unfortunately, too many times our bosses, <laughs> as to what constitutes great storytelling and the important information that people need to hear and to know. What about the story on the Palestinian scientist? Wh where was that documentary or that story? What about, what about this? We, we, we live in way too narrow a frame. And I think one of the most important things that we can do, that, the, that mainstream journalists and non-traditional journalists can do, is declare fully and flatly, it is our job to take you places you have not been before, intellectually, emotionally, geographically, ideologically, and expose you to the sometimes uncomfortable and unconventional. I, I really think that will serve 
a very large purpose. Can, can we also stipulate, though, that it's also our job to tear down falsehoods that yeah, lead yeah, yeah, to yeah, war yeah, all of that. and that lead to and that perpetuate that's, war? That's part yeah. of that. That's, yeah. that's part of that. I think that's part Fortunately, of it. Fortunately, increasingly, it's a <laughs> large part of it. I think, Marvin, you wanted one last comment. Well, no, I, I get back to the same thing, and I'll, I'll bore myself soon. Please search for what it is that is truthful and think about these definitions again and again and again. Who's the journalist? Where does this information come from? How reliable is the picture? What are we looking at? There is so much chatter in the world today that we end up at the end of the day eating at smaller and smaller tables where our our biases or our lifetime experiences are reconfirmed and we feel that is good journalism. Please, we should all just try to look beyond that. Thank you and thank you to all of our panel here today and thank you very much for your questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to do all of them. But that was my best to your parents. I hope so.